All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Whitey and Wills podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the Effingham area prep sports scene and beyond. I am Dustin White, one of your hosts, along with Mike Wilson, back for week number four. We haven't gotten yes. sick of each other yet. Not yet. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just a couple hours a week, you know, by the time it's all said and done. So we're, we're not going to we're not going to wear each other, wear each other down too much. I don't think. We haven't turned into that old married couple yet. We're okay. <laughs> hey, and Whitey, I just noticed, is that um, the at symbol you're wearing on your shirt today? No. Oh. A little, little something different. A little something you were, different. You were partially hidden in the screenshot. I thought you had the at symbol. I guess that is the, uh, the Braves are in the playoffs. They you? are. We've got, uh, I've got a week. I've got a week to feel good about the Braves and then it'll probably come crashing down pretty quick. I would imagine. I don't, it's one of those deals where I don't have a real, real high set of expectations for how the postseason will go. Just kind of glad that they were able to get in with, uh, with some of the guys they lost this season. So um, that that's, that's fine. We'll get to that in a little bit. We uh, just to let everybody know, uh, First week that we've got uh, no guest on the show today, but that's okay because uh, this is a pretty good week of uh, prep sports to talk about. The uh, Effingham area has got some good stuff going on. We had an exciting, uh, exciting Effingham High School football game last week. The National Trail Baseball Tournament is going to be going on this week. Uh, Mike's got some good golf stuff to uh, talk about, and so we figure we could. We could fill the space uh, pretty well this week, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get a guest on next week. It sounds like. Well, and, and we did have someone this week, but with me leaving after the show and heading to the golf sectional today for having a young man qualify. Congratulations to Aiden Jansen. Um, our guest is volunteering at the Effingham sectional golf out at the Country Club today, so his time was very limited when he can do it you and i have are helping on the radio this week do ntc baseball mm -hmm. um so and i've got another commitment tomorrow night so we just uh, you know we decided and we moved the guests back a week and you know unfortunately they have to listen to you and us drone on today but that's okay uh yeah the ntc baseball this week that's uh, weather permitting, of course, it looks the forecast this week, the last I checked anyway, seemed like it's pretty spotty, could cause some problems. We'll, we'll see one way or another. They pretty much need to be done uh, by the end of the week. And we've seen them have to get pretty creative in the past. Sometimes, sometimes it necessitates pushing things back to Monday if you can't get all the games played. But uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, Wednesday looks like the only wet day. Is that right? Well, that's a little better than the last time I checked, so that's okay. Yeah, the uh, we're recording this on Monday. Uh, it's October fourth, um, and the the quarterfinal round is today. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and get a little fancy here. I've, I made up a I got on one of those online bracket generators and 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 set this up. So you should be seeing uh, you should be seeing the NTC baseball tournament. Um, there's, it's actually a nine-team tournament, so if you go to this look, you'll see that they had the 8-9 game on Friday, and Diederich did beat uh, Neogo. That was the 8 beating the 9 seed in the little play-in game. So now that sets up today's uh, today's games. Um, you've got the number one seed, North Clay, taking on Diederich. Uh, and then on that same half of the bracket, number four, South Central, and number five, Altamont, which is a – a really, a really good little toss-up game there. Uh, you could see either one of those teams winning, and really giving uh, giving those uh, top-seeded Cardinals a pretty good matchup in the in the semifinal round. And then on the bottom half of the bracket here, uh, St. Anthony is your number two seed. They're going to play uh, CHBC today. Uh, that's one of the games that we're going to have on the radio. The other one is that South Central Altamont game. Uh, not sure which station is carrying which, but I know that uh, I know that. Uh, Altamont and South Central will be one of our games. And then I know I'm with Greg um, doing the St. Anthony CHBC game. Then on that uh, same half of the bracket, Windsor Stoose Draws will play Brownstown St. Elmo. That's a three versus six. And, and Windsor Stoose Draws, a very good three seed. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of interesting things can happen. So, you know, this North Clay, 
is very good. They've, uh, I believe, just lost the they one game. Winning. Yeah, they yeah they've winning. lost the one game this fall, and that was to T-Town, a team that they also beat a handful of times. They ran, they yeah, they kept running into each other, uh, different uh, different times. So, you know, um, prohibitive favorite, obviously the number one seed. But I think you look at the rest of that bracket, and as far as um, how it might shake out, there's a number of realistic ways it could go, and that'll make for that'll make for a fun tournament. Should be a good tournament. There's a lot of balance there. I know North Clay's lost the one game. Um, St. Anthony's had a pretty strong fall. They've kind of had to reload with a lot of young kids. Um, I was kind of surprised when I saw the the seedings to see Aldemont at a five. Yeah. I saw them in South Central. Um, I did that game with Matt. Um, I don't remember if that was a sectional. I think it was a sectional final um, down at South Central. Um, real good ball clubs. And, uh, you know, Windsor's Two Straws just got a uh, nice win last week <clears throat> um, over T-Town. So a lot yeah. of balance there. And um, that, that's usually a really, really good tournament. And I think the, this year will be no exception. Yeah, and the format of it is such that it can tend to balance things out a little bit. Um, you play if, – if it goes according to schedule, you play three games in five days. And so even if uh, during the course of the regular season you're able to, to stack up some wins, well, you've – yeah, I mean, you've never had to, to necessarily uh, deploy as much of your top pitching over a five-game stretch – uh, during the NTC regular season as you do uh, to win this tournament. So it it, uh, it takes some creativity, I think, on the part of coaches. Uh, usually some guts, I think. Uh, when you're one of the top-seeded teams deciding who you're going to throw on this Monday game because, yeah, you know, like St. Anthony is a two playing a seven, a heavy favorite, but, uh, you know, you got to decide – what you're, what you, what pitching you're going to use, and sometimes that allows those uh, lower seated teams who are probably going to come at you with their best, just trying to advance, or at least they're going to think about it. Uh, it can, it can make those matchups a little better on the field than they are on paper. Well, you know, and with the ITSA's pitch count, like you said, now do you? Oh, you know, it's our first game. We're a high seed. We're okay. We're going to throw our number three pitcher um and like you said all of a sudden a higher you know a, a seven seed's got got a pretty good arm and, and he's on mm -hmm. or you run into the fact you have extra innings or you have a high scoring game all of a sudden and you start using kids and you know now skippy has to come in and throw an inning who's thrown two innings all year um there's a lot of planning. Pitching depth is so important. And it's now, you know, back in the day, you had two arms. You could ride them a long way in the spring season, in the postseason. Um, you really can't anymore. And this is a perfect example here, you know, in this fall tournament where you need that third arm just because of pitch count numbers. Yeah, I mean – uh, in the days before uh, mandated pitch counts. And, and this is not me saying in the glory days either. I think that by and large, IHSA has the right idea in uh, trying to maintain arm health. Uh, there's no perfect way to do it. You know, uh, pitch counts are an inexact science because 50 pitches can be made in so many different ways. 50 pitches over two innings is so much more taxing than 50 pitches over four innings. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing, but, but uh, as far as these uh, pitch count rules go, they, they are, um, you know, but they've got the right idea. So this is not a, this is not, well, back in the day, things were so much better back when men were men and, and you know, we're not, we're not going down that road, but I do right. remember in the not too distant past that uh, St. Anthony was able to get through this NTC tournament and, and, a uh, young man, a senior by the name of Greg Schmidt, was able to pitch every one of those games. Now, they did get a little help uh, because the weather uh, pushed, kind of spread the schedule out a little bit. But that was just a case of a, a kid, a senior, who said, you know, I, I'm not really planning on playing anywhere after this, and I'd really like to win this tournament. And he was clearly the best pitcher they had, and they did it. But 
you wouldn't be able to get away with it anymore. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a case of the kid being mistreated. He was, and, and also kids are just different levels of maturity. You know what I'm saying? Some kids you can do that with, and some kids you can't. Some kids you can trust with that decision. Some kids you can't. I think that I don't have any problems with them doing that, but I will say that it just isn't, it's just not a thing anymore. I believe he was a crafty lefty, wasn't he? Yeah, that was another thing is that he was not a max effort pitcher. He wasn't one of those kids that was going out there and, uh, you know, giving 110 percent on every pitch. So trying to blow everybody away. No, exactly. Yeah, it was a case of more of a kid that uh, could throw strikes, uh, didn't give up a lot of solid contact. Uh, and, and you know what? It worked for them. But, uh, you know, uh, again, North Clay, you know, we've seen them. They're very good. They've got a lot of kids that have been playing varsity baseball for what seems like forever. And there's uh, no reason to, to be offended if you're any one of the other seven schools still in the field to hear me say that North Clay is, you know, a pretty heavy favorite in this tournament. But again, the, the format being what it is, it sort of keeps that, keeps that door propped open. So if things go a little sideways on Monday or Wednesday, that it could leave you with an interesting situation for that championship game. And, and you know, I, I saw North Clay, like an inning of the game you did at the Wooden Battle of St. Anthony when they win on a triple play, walk off triple play. <laughs> um, and then they come back and then I'm doing the game against T-Town in the championship and they're just, you know, they're down six, seven run, just – and then all of a sudden, two innings in a row, T-Town um, starts kicking the ball around in the sixth and then has trouble throwing strikes in the seventh, and they win. And I'm like – I was like, wow, they got two wins in games. They very, very easily could have had two losses. However, they just keep winning. And I know they're deep with their pitching staff. They don't have deep dominant pitching, but they have kids who are um, who are very efficient and very um, you know they can just keep running a kid or two out there who can throw strikes and and uh, and, are, and are not throwing batting practice and um, you know they've built a nice program down there they really have and uh, they are I, I think they are the favorite going in. However, don't be surprised if they don't win it just because, um, you know, they won a lot of close ball games. However, a lot of those close ball games could have gone the other way for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, St. Anthony's very good, you know, two seed, very good team. Just saw Windsor Stoose draws uh, last week playing over at T-Town. And, you know, they, I'll be honest with you, the hatchets didn't, uh, I don't necessarily think that they had, uh, as, as far as the pitching goes, I don't think they had their A game that night over at T-Town. They still were able to, to hold on and get a victory. Um, so they're they're dangerous. And and you mentioned being surprised to see Altamont down there at number five seed. Altamont got the season started off really hot. Like they they played some really good baseball, uh, beat some beat some teams pretty handily. Uh, got got a lot of uh, big hits and timely hits early on in the season, and so I mean they're talented. There's there's no doubt about it. Um, I think that those are all teams that if they if they hit on all four cylinders at the right time, well then you know you could very well see them uh, see them playing Friday night for the championship, and that's the way it works. Uh, the quarterfinals are all at four o'clock this afternoon. Again, today is Monday where we're recording it. Uh, the semifinals Wednesday, and then on uh, on Friday they'll play a third place game at four o'clock in the championship at seven. And those games are down at Ken Mundy, which is if you got a chance to go, you know Ken Mundy is a hell of a place to watch a baseball game. It's a nice little nice yes. little field uh, cut out of the woods, but uh, Kurt Jones and and crew uh, do a great job of keeping it up. And it's uh, it's. I remember the first time I ever went and saw a game there. I had I had never been to the field before and was just so impressed with the with the the feel of it, you know. Back in the 80s when I student taught there at Dietrich, we played there and it's a much different facility now than it was. But um, you know, you mentioned the different teams and you know, the defending state champ is at a four seed mm -hmm. um, in South Central. They're playing, you know, if they get to the final four, you know, they're, I mean, the finals are at home. Um, 
can't sleep on them. I know they lost some kids to graduation, but uh, I'll tell you what, I think they're still, you know, the game I did with Matt, Bo Jolliffe hit a home run. I think they're still looking for the ball. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that ball was crushed. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's, so that, that's the thing. You, it, it's, uh, I know North Clay is the favorite, but again, you got a lot of people, uh, you know, gunning for that crown. Yeah. Well, I think that is pretty well covered. Um, I think we can move on from the NTC baseball, unless you got anything else to say about it. Um, I know that, uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, you got a golf sectional to get to today. Why don't we, why don't we segue into that? Well, you know, I'll touch on a few things. Um, St. Anthony hosted the boys regional Wednesday out of the country club. Country club was just, it's an incredible condition. And it usually is. And, and they did a great job. Uh, Jim Krause kind of runs things and uh, as the head pro out there, as far as helping the tournament run along, uh, Phil's a carry. St. Anthony was the host, you know, not Phil's first rodeo. Everything went smooth. I, I, I question the intelligence of uh, Coach Zakari as the, um, when I was put on the rules committee, um, I think it's just a case sometimes where, hey, Wilson won't say no. Let's, I'm like, you're on the rules committee. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's always a bad thing. And for, uh, now, I had to make a ruling. It was with one of my own kids. So I'm like, I, I know what we should do here. And it's really going to have no effect on whether a kid gets to go to state or not, or another kid from going to state. But I brought over, actually, Phil was nearby, and I got him on the phone and said, hey, come over here. I just don't want to do a ruling on my own kid. Um, so it went well. Um, St. Anthony just played spectacular. They shot a 297, and in golf, you take your top four scores, and their scores, and I'll go backwards, actually. Joey Truppiano had an 81, Charlie Wegman an 80, both non-counters. I think Charlie Wegman was like, eight over three, nine, and shot even on the back, something like that. He, he all of a sudden, you know, because I'm watching the scores on my phone the whole time. Lane Ludwig and Dakota Flegg both shot 76s. Thomas Warnicke is 75. Jonathan Willenberg is 72 under. He was three under at one time. I actually ran into him. He was on his 15th hole, and he bogeyed, you know, two holes, and I'm like, Willenberg. Uh, you know, I didn't pay good money to come out here and watch you get bogeys. And then he was, I had about 50 yards in on a par four and knocked it to about a foot and got another birdie to get to two under. But uh, great job by the Bulldogs. Um, Oblong got second, 315, a, a great number. Probably wins a lot of regionals in the state. Unfortunately, it didn't win this one. And third place, um, I wasn't surprised. But as I'm watching on my phone, the scores, because the kids have to enter them on an app. So you're watching real time, every hole, everything's updated, everything's updated. Um, Aldemont nipped Mount Carmel by a stroke to get the third team spot out. Um, Kevin Hall, Avery Jarhouse, Tyler Stone Cypher, Max Runge, AJ Copeland, and Zach Ripitor, they're players. And I'll tell you what, these kids, um, have really turned into nice players and we've run into them on occasion at tournaments and a uh, good group of kids, uh, Tyler Stone Cypher. Uh, we ran into them. I, I jokingly, he owes me five bucks. He had a ball that was going for trouble and bounced off my cart and I kept him out of the lake. Um, but no, really good individuals, top 10 individuals go. Um, Hayden Jansen got the 10th spot. He was actually, he had it because there was no one tied with him. So I knew he was in pretty good shape. And um, I actually thought he was going to be ninth or tied for ninth and he ended up 10th. So, uh, you know, congratulations to those guys. They're all down at a, um, a very soggy green view down in Mount Vernon today. We were down there yesterday. Uh, I went down with Hayden for a practice round and uh, coach or the coach, the course was a little, a uh, little soggy to say the least. Now, Effingham hosts a two-way sectional today out at the country club. Um, and they actually, Effingham High School had three golfers get out of their regional down at Olney. Colby Haynes, Riker Schneider, 
and the Ethan Ritz. Those guys all got out, so they're going to get to play at home today in the sectional. Um, if we weren't down south at Mount Vernon, I would probably go out there today to watch uh, this kid from Minton, um, Cy Norman. He's just – I've had people tell me he's probably – Possibly he has a good shot at winning the state as an individual. So um, it'll be interesting to see. And then uh, girls golf, they go to, hang on here, I got to switch back and forth. You know, most people would have this written down, but I'm relying on the, the speed of my fingers getting through the web, the World Wide Web. They actually go to Auburn today. The girls go north now instead of south. But um, St. Anthony hosted uh, – the girls sectional and the St. Anthony girls won it with 324. They won it by 40 shots. Um, Allison Green, Maddie Bremer, Abby Krause had an 87, Nina Hackman an 81, Ellie Wigman an 80, and Lawrence Schwing a 76. You know, really good team scores. And then Effingham girls have um, three girls advancing, Ella Nieberge, Mara Kirk, and Elena Nieberge all got out as individuals. So they get to go up to Auburn. They're up near Springfield today. Um, and again, tremendous, uh, you know, good luck to all these kids who are advancing. Um, you know, hopefully they'll get to go one more step. The state moved everything up a week. Because everything used to be, state tournament used to be Columbus Day weekend. Uh, I'm sorry, the sectional always was Columbus Day Monday. And now the state will be played this Friday, Saturday before Columbus Day. Uh, it's probably been three or four years ago. I remember watching uh, Luke Ludwig at St. Anthony on video putting in the snow. Um, it started snowing in Bloomington and it's tracking up like Frosty the Snowman as it's rolling across the green. So the state moved everything up a week. Um, so that should help. But yeah. I know I've been to uh, when my daughter played at state two years in a row. Uh, she never started first round on Friday with the temperature in in the 40s. It was always in the 30s. And First time up there, there was one parent, not so smart guy with a flat top, was the only person in shorts. <laughs> um, he had several other layers on, and um, but yeah, he thought he needed to make a statement, which was, "Hey, I'm not very smart." I think, but um, state tournaments always tremendous watching these kids play, and it's a lot nicer if at least when they start, it's you know, 50 degrees, not 38. That, that does seem like it's a pretty common tale that you hear is that, uh, you know, we get to this time of year and it's just not, it's not ideal golf weather. And I'm, I'm not, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to make it all work. I understand but uh, yeah, I remember hearing similar stories about the conditions at the state tournament and, and, you know, on one hand, well, everybody's, everybody's dealing with it. So it's a That's little right. playing field, but you want it to you want to do what you can to make it an enjoyable experience for the kids too and so uh i think it sounds like they've taken whatever steps they can to 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 move it up a little bit and still uh still give them a full season yeah you really uh, you can't have the you condense it much more now you got kids you know because everybody wants to get in the number of contests you can get in people say oh well you know basketball you know they get there so many contests every school fulfills that you know football nine weeks they don't say hey we're only gonna play eight because you know but you know it gets pretty condensed um it, it gets going really fast after about two weeks into the season it seems like you have about three matches a week and you really get going so that's good um you know weather the same thing girls tennis is still i don't think they got moved um you know, and I hear the stories about them having to sometimes play indoors in Chicago because of the uh, the temperatures. Nothing you can do about the rain, obviously, or sleet, as I've heard before. You know, girls tennis, um, you know, in our area, sounds like the topless is very strong. Um, I know I've had some people tell me team-wise, maybe the best overall team they've had. So I know they've got expectations. Um of moving into the postseason, we'll have to see what happens there, and and um, we'll reach out to Coach Daters. I'm going to get some information for them next week yeah. as they move on because uh, they're a, a really good group of kids. Um, now, Whitey, our last high school fall thing to talk about right now today. Yeah, and 
I was tied up doing some home improvement Friday afternoon here at the house, which is um, somewhat amazing that, because I'm not even allowed to hang pictures in my house. So um, my, my wife and I were doing some work trying to get a ceiling fan replaced, which we did. So, you know, we get attaboys for that. But, um, and then I was kind of following the Cardinal Cubs and, and, and I literally, I didn't listen to you guys. Wow. And I'm like, oh my, I need to, yeah, this is, you know, I need to do this. So I got on Twitter real quick. I figured the Twitterverse, there'd be a score. And I see uh, whatever score you guys had late, I think Effingham was leading. And I thought, wow. So I clicked on my XEF app and literally I hear uh, Mr. Wessendorf run for the first down. The, the only play I heard was he got the first down and then they went into victory formation. and. I can tell you guys have had an incredible game because Greg was the, he had almost that Peter Brady uh, sneaking into puberty going in his voice, you know, getting so excited. And, and that's the thing I love about Greg because he's so um, authentic when he gets excited because his voice changes and uh, it was great listening to you guys. And, and you could just tell how excited you guys were. I mean, you, most excited I've heard you do stats since, uh, you yeah. know, Freddie Freeman. Got there. Well, so we, that was impressive. We, I think we try to be the right amount of, uh, be the, get the right level of Homer on our broadcasts because we know who our audience is. But uh, yeah, it was an exciting. Want to be that guy? Yeah, you don't want to. Over wanna, the top. You don't want to be the over the top. No, and and I think we do a pretty good job. Uh, it was a great game, you know, Effingham. It was kind of an up and down thing. Uh, the Hearts were ahead by a couple of scores early, and uh, Mount Zion's stud running back, um, he, he came out of the game basically after one series, you know, uh, if I remember right, very early. Uh, he only got one carry, and um, he actually got hurt playing defense. Matthias Adams, uh, he got hurt, got hurt playing defense and never came back in. And Effingham, you know, the, uh, Mount Zion was uh, – they were they were having some struggles holding on to the football, uh, some timing issues, I think, on their snaps mostly because they kept – a couple of times they had snaps hit the man in motion and who didn't appear to be looking for the ball. Uh, they were – and it's interesting because they were trying to do some direct snap stuff to the kid uh, later on in the game. And so I think – I don't know what the confusion was. All I know is that it stalled out a couple of their drives and Effingham took advantage. Uh, John Westendorf, you mentioned him. He scored four touchdowns in that game. He scored all four touchdowns for Effingham. And, uh, yeah, they were ahead, uh, ahead a couple of scores, but then Mount Zion scored three in a row and start getting uh, some throws downfield. And uh, you're thinking, uh, we're in trouble here because they've got a kid by the name of Cahey, uh, Christian Cahey, and uh, he, he'd go wide and – pretty tough to cover in single coverage. If you can't get any pressure on the quarterback and, and you're allowing him to, to just throw it downfield and let this kid go get it, you're going to have a long night. And he had some, some big catches that uh, uh, worked out for them. And they've got all this momentum. And you're thinking, you know, you're down, down a score now. Uh, maybe we're in a little bit of trouble. But uh, the, the one saving grace was that uh, they had a botched – a botched um, extra point, and that ended up being the difference in the game. Two two kick plays ended up being the difference in the game because Effingham got up 28-27, um, and then the only turnover of the game was one big thing, and I'll get, get to that in a second because that was a big play in the game and a couple of kids that need to be shouted out there. But uh, also, you know, unfortunately for Mount Zion, they get it down to the five-yard line, with uh, 245 left and decide to, to kick a field goal. It's fourth and goal. And they decide to kick a field goal and it hits the hits the upright, hits the crossbar, and bounces out. Um, you know, it was a 23-yard field goal, I think, uh, based on uh, based on where the ball was uh, kicked from. And at the time during the broadcast, I actually was a little more critical of that decision than I think I should have been 
Um, you know, I kind of said after they kicked it, I was like, oh, I'm not sure why they did that because they're moving the football pretty well. But in hindsight, you know, being five yards out still, fourth down, like it's a lot of things cool. can happen there. It's pretty I'm close to an there. extra point. So, you know, um, I don't know. It It's tough in a high school game because most high school teams, even the best ones, you know, generally aren't blessed with the kind of kicking that Effingham has. Effingham's got some good kids kicking the football for them, and they right. generally do. But it's 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 tough to find those guys. And so they miss that field goal. Effingham gets to the point where all they need to do is uh, get one first down to end the game because Mount Zion had already used all its timeouts, and they did it. Uh, but but there was a key play. Effingham's still leading by one point at this point in the game in the fourth quarter where they throw a pass to uh, – to a young man, uh, Kieran Petty, who catches the ball, gets behind his defender, catches the ball, but they never gave up on the play. Max Nelson ran him down. Max Nelson was in coverage, uh, never gave up on the play, ran him down, and inside, tackled him inside the 10-yard line from behind. He loses the football, and then you had, uh, you had, uh, you had Connor Simmons, uh, safety for the team, uh, fall on, get, get the football and bring it back. And so you go, you're this close, this close to uh, to Mount Zion scoring a go-ahead touchdown, and instead they turn it over. It was the only turnover of the game for either so team. So was that before or after the missed field goal? That was before. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean. So that was their, the field goal was really Mount Zion's second opportunity. Yeah, missed. they yeah they they had some chances. They had some chances, and, and you know, the Hearts made, made a big play there when they needed it. Um, and then got a little bit of uh, good fortune on their side on that field goal. Now, they would have had time. You know, if the field goal is good, you got, uh, you know, like I said, 245 to try and try and do something. And John Westendorf had also been something that you don't really talk about much, but he'd been really good on the kickoff returns too. Um, Mount Zion, their, their kickoffs were not uh, boomers usually. Uh, they weren't getting into the end zone. And so as long as you can pick it up off the bounce, you're usually able to have a little time for a return. And John had done a pretty good job of that. So if he if he'd gotten a chance, you know, maybe set up some good field position, maybe move the football down the field. But you'd obviously rather not be in that position. So, yeah, Effingham's three and three. Uh, you know, that's a game you go to Mount Zion and beat them. That's uh, an accomplishment pretty much any year. Right. Yeah, it does. If I'm going to be if I'm going to be Debbie Downer a little bit, it makes you look back on the Matt Toon game, which was winnable, and wish a lot of turnovers, wasn't it? Yeah, ten turnovers between the two teams. Effingham turned over six times in that game, and that's I mean that's not going to be it's not going to be hardly anybody, right? But uh, you lose that game by one score, and you you think about some what ifs there. Um, you could be four and two if you win that game, but there's no point and really dwelling on it. And furthermore, you can't take Lincoln for granted this week because you got Lincoln at home. Lincoln beat Matt Toon this past week. And, and they almost beat Mount Zion. Yeah, they they played Mount Zion tough. Um, this, is not, this is not a Lincoln team that has played in the Apollo Conference before. Not uh, your the, father's Lincoln. Yeah, or I guess I've said your older brother's Lincoln since that's all the – that's the only point of reference that I think anybody in Effingham could really have since it's not right. been that since long. They've since. not been in the Apollo that long. Sure. Yeah. But since they've been in the Apollo, they have basically been for everybody, but Charleston, an automatic win. Um, and that's not going to be the case. And I know the coach Hefner is not going to let his kids have that mindset anyway, but it's homecoming week and, and coaches, uh, you know, I mean, Coach McDonald used to talk about it too. Um, homecoming week comes comes with a lot of distractions. Uh, you're thinking about you're thinking about the activities at school. You're thinking about the parade. You're thinking about the girl you're going to take to the dance. And uh, and this year you might be thinking about uh, you know what you're going to wear to that dance because it's going to be out. Apparently, it's going to be outdoors this year. And so, anyway. Uh, a lot of things for the young mind to, to wander over. And so coaches worry about that stuff. But now, uh, why do they? Okay, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, they have a secret weapon this year. 
Um, the ghosts of Hart's lore will be present Friday night. Is that right? Is that when your reunion is? Our 40th class reunion, and worth the word to be in attendance at the game. And we graduated in 81, obviously, but our senior football season was 1980. Mm -hmm. So it's been 41 years for football um, since we were in the semifinals. And I know a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of my former teammates um, will be back in attendance. So there is, uh, you know, there that's you know, we could be bringing in the supernatural. You know, there's there's special things can happen because you know we had a a gifted wide receiver who was not very fast, but he could catch everything. You know, we it's an interesting group, and a lot of these guys. I'm actually. Friday morning, unfortunately, I have to play golf with a lot of them. Um, oh, so that'll be tough. That'll be tough. But um, this it, it's going to be like fun. To I know a lot of the guys are going to be back. So what this feels like to me, Mike, is that when when the Hearts win this game Friday night, you're going to try to you guys you're, you're going to try to take some sort of credit for it. That's all. That's all oh, this no. feels like to me. No credit. No credit taken because um, I'm sure knowing the guys who are coming back they'll be very winded after the playing <laughs> golf Friday morning. So uh, <laughs> will they know, be I, upright? That's the question. Well, yes, but you know, some of these guys, you don't know by like three o'clock if they'll still be. Um, so we'll have to see, but uh, no, it, it should be fun. And um, you know, we're looking forward to it. A group of guys getting back together um, probably haven't been together as a group in a long time, you know, maybe yeah. since we, you know, since we played, to be honest, you know, because kids travel, you know, and guys are all over the country. Um, Kenny Brockett, Rick Mansfield coming back from Florida, and Sean Rainey's down in Texas. Steve Finolio, if they'll let him in the country, is coming over from England. Um, we got guys everywhere, and uh, we're but we're excited. It'll be a lot of fun, and uh, it is. You know, Coach. You know, Coach Hefner. He's. You know, if he needs that pregame speech, you know, I'm, I'm sure. You know, we can come in and mumble eight words or something, you know, or, you know, nothing more than that. I think that, I mean, the thing that he also has on his side, and this is Coach Heffner I'm talking about, is that his kids understand that just like this past week at Mount Zion, I mean, this is a game you got to have, right? Like you can't, you're, you're on, you, you have to win out to get to six and you look at the schedule and that's, that's a pretty tough proposition. So uh, with, uh, with, with modern day with, with five and points, I think they have a shot. Yeah, the points are the points are going to be there because it's been such a good schedule that I do think I think playoff points work on their schedule. But the fact of the matter is that you're you're not controlling your own destiny then. And so you can't you really can't right. afford to think that way. But you do know that with, with modern day and Highland looming, that this Lincoln game is it's must win. I mean, I think you have right. to look at it that way. And his kids understand that. And so the, I would think that the intensity is going to be there. They're not going to take anything for granted. And uh, plus they're back home for the first time in a couple, you know, I mean, they've, they've been on the road the last two weeks and gotten tough wins at places that are not easy to, to win at. And so they, there's no reason in the world to, to feel like they're going to take the game lightly. Um, and, and that's good because they can't. Lincoln's going to be a handful. Uh, but I think if the hearts play well, I mean, that's what I said before this Mount Zion game uh, during our pregame. I said, you know, this is this is a good Mount Zion team. Uh, you don't have to play a perfect game to beat them, but you got to play your A game. And and Effingham did. They played their A game, and they're going to need they're going to need that again this week. And I don't think, Coach, you know, like you said, um, all the distractions, and it is, um, but Coach isn't going to let that get in the way they're not going to be you know looking beyond Lincoln oh we've got Lincoln no here's you know trust me they're hearing about Lincoln you know beating Matt Toon who beat Effingham so the old well they beat them they beat them so mm -hmm. they're going to beat you um you always hate to hear that but as a coach you use that to your advantage when you think your kids may be looking past an opponent um yeah. you know hey they they were one play away you know possibly from taking Mount Zion to overtime think about it we uh 
they fumbled inside the 10 and missed a uh, chip shot field goal or they beat us. So I think they'll be, FEM will be very grounded and I wouldn't be surprised to see them come out, um, really come out with a chip on their shoulder to start this game. And I think early, I, I think their, their first quarter when they come out, I think um, they have the opportunity to set the tone and, you know, they've grounded, you know, they can run the ball and pound it. And, and I think if they can put together a good drive to start and their defense can, um, you know, get off the field quickly and just, just set the tone, I think is really a big thing for them, especially in this game. And it allows everybody to exhale a little bit. This time of year, another thing that always concerns me is late season games is what the field's going to be like. But there's some good fortune there too, because here, here's the reason I say that is because a, a, a chewed up field in week seven can sometimes be an equalizer, even if one team's a little more talented than the other. If the playing conditions devolve, then anything can happen. Turnovers, uh, kids falling down, who knows? But there's a couple things here. Uh, Effingham, again, hasn't played at home for the last two weeks, so there hasn't been a ton of action on that field. And if the forecast uh, works out, okay this week like we were talking, talking about probably earlier. 69 degrees of kickoff yeah i mean we got some we got a pretty decent amount of rain this past weekend um and or at least we did in here in yoga I, I guess i haven't been to effingham but i assume that you guys got a little bit uh saturday we probably got uh i think i had a little over a half inch saturday and i haven't checked what we got yesterday so anyway, I guess my point is that uh, that shouldn't be too much of a factor either. You can just come out and play your game. You should be able to. Um, so that'll be nice. It'll be it'll be nice just to be back across from the field. They they take uh, they took good care of us at Taylorville. Uh, they take better care of us at Mount Zion than they used to. And uh, but it'll still be nice to be it'll be nice to be in that press box across from the field this weekend. Do they bring snacks up to the deer uh, no, deer they, stand now? No, the the deer stand actually um, we don't have to sit there anymore. Um, what they put uh, they when they built their new turf field, which by the way the complex there at Mount Zion is real nice. I mean, people who live there should be really proud to to have what they have there. Uh, the 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 athletics building that they have, and then the all turf uh, field. It's it's great stuff. Uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic venue for high school football. Uh, but they also have some better uh, some bleachers on the visiting side of the field. The hold a fair amount of people and they put on the back row of that. They put a row for uh, visiting visiting press. I mean, you're still outdoors, but at least you got a tabletop to work with. And it's not uh, two radio stations and uh, the Effingham coaching staff all crammed into one uh, eight by eight square uh, up off the ground. Uh, that was that was never great. Now the coaches can just have the deer stand and the the two radio stations that uh, cover Effingham football uh, were able to to spread out. So I can't I can't even complain too much as long as it Baby doesn't steps. rain. Yeah, Baby it's steps. good. It's fine. So it was it was it was nice and the weather was you know still pretty good. Actually, kind of unseasonably warm Friday night still for. Uh, you know, the first night of October, uh, it was a pretty good field condition. So, yeah, uh, again, you know, you got Lincoln this week and then got to go to modern day the following week. So you want to play well in this game. You don't just want to win. You like to play pretty well because uh, you're going to – you talk about teams that you're going to need to play well to go on the road and beat. Well, modern day is real good. So, so you know, it, it just doesn't get any easier. But uh, – you're right. Five wins might be enough uh, with the playoff points that Effingham is going to accrue this year. But they need that fifth win still, they, and they need the fourth win before they get the fifth, and that's where Lincoln goes. Uh, one bite at a time, and, and like I said, I, I, I wish them well. Um, I hope I'm able to be in attendance. We'll have to see, but um, we'll see what shakes out. So that, uh, I think, pretty much covers the local scene. I don't know if you want to hit on uh, – Hit on a little baseball yesterday was um, yesterday was kind of a letdown for me as far as major league baseball goes because uh, you, you wanted had, chaos didn't you? yeah you had the potential for four teams to all be tied for the wild card spots in the American League but uh, the more as the day wore on 
and the Yankees won a game in the ninth inning against the Rays. But the Red Sox were down 5-2 in about the sixth. Yeah, they I'm watching, were. I'm checking, you know, scores on my uh, phone, and then I saw Yankees were scoreless. Um, Blue Jays took care of business, and the Mariners gave up Mariners three in the name. first against yeah. the Angels. And they yeah. kind of dug themselves a hole. I think the Cardinals had the uh, the spring training rain out yesterday. It's like, yeah. okay, we're done. Um, and oh, by the way, they they're not going to be corporate sponsor because they did lose three games. Now That's that fine. we're in podcast is there, so yeah, I thought we had a shot. the yeah the American League the way it could have shaken out was that if the Red Sox lost and the Yankees lost and the Blue Jays and Mariners both won their games, then it's yeah, you would have that four way tie. But as I saw. As I saw somebody point out, um, if you're if you go into the last day of the season needing the Nationals bullpen to hold on to a lead a lead against uh, the Red Sox, well, you know you got to really reevaluate. Uh, <laughs> you you got to reevaluate things a little bit. And the Mariners, what 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 I kind of feel about the Mariners is that it's a fun team, and it was nice to see them go on a run. But you get to you take a team that's just overall not great and put them in a situation where they have to win one game. Well, I think you kind of saw what can happen there. If you don't happen to have your top pitcher set to go, which they absolutely did not, you know, they got Otani right off the bat and then just could never really recover. I mean, the angels, angels had nothing to play for either. You know, they're just playing spoiler, but uh, yeah. And so now you got the national league, you mentioned the Cardinals and they're going to have to play a wild card game against the Dodgers. Uh, See, I didn't think Scherzer was lined up. I thought I read where he was throwing one of these last three games because they were still trying to get the regular season. But I now I read today it's Ian Wainwright. Um, yeah, Wednesday. I so it's a guy yeah. throwing ninety eight and a guy throwing eighty. Adam Wainwright's season has been pretty amazing because I really thought he was cooked. Uh, he's one of those guys that kind of just figured out how to pitch with diminished stuff, you know, I mean, his curveball still moves a lot, but uh, you know, he obviously can't get it up to the plate with his fastball the same way he once did, but you know, he's a, he's a smart guy. He's a determined guy. And he was far and away the Cardinals best pitcher this season. Uh, yeah. If his curveball, if he, if he is on and there was a game Late where I don't know if it's against the Brewers or somebody where he really didn't have much command. Um, got behind, they came back and won. But if he's on, it's a coin toss. Now, I have a question. If you're the Yankees, Yankees Boston play their wild card tomorrow, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're the Yankees, and this is at Boston, right? Yes. I think it's at Boston. Doesn't Bucky Dent carry out the the uh, lineup card? <laughs> I mean, if you want to just poke the bear, send Bucky effing Dent out there, as his nickname became after that home run, send him out with the, the lineup card. Yeah, I don't know. That would get the fans riled up, but uh, do you think any oh, of these – get the teams riled up too. I up. guess. Do you think any of these players even – I mean, they probably know who – they probably no. know about it, but do you think they – you think they care? I don't know. No, but if you're the Red Sox players, you know all about it, and then you've had the, uh, you know, it's just it's when just, when they sang, uh, wasn't it the Red Sox, whose couple of them stood outside the Yankee locker room singing "New York, New York" because there's something <laughs> Aaron Judge. I mean, there's, it's. I don't think it's at the level of Pedro Martinez going after Don Zimmer in a brawl. Now wait a minute, Don Zimmer went after Pedro Martinez. I'm Team Pedro on that one. I'm sorry, but uh, well, and I yeah, but if you're, yeah, you're going to go after somebody, you better be ready to. You better be Pedro ready. Martinez is, was a is, it was a more dominant was a dominant pitcher, but um. Yeah, that, and, and I saw J.D. Martinez tweaked his ankle yesterday for the yeah, Red he Sox. Did. He's he questionable. Did. Max Muncy, the Dodgers, got hurt. He's out for a, a little while. Yeah. That's big. Yeah, he's – well, you know, the Dodgers just make me sick because you look at their lineup on any given day, and it's like everybody's got an OPS over 800. I mean, one through eight. Um, and that's the thing about Muncy is that, yeah, it hurts them to lose him, but they've – 
They'll just put Matt Beatty at first base or something, and the guy will oh, hit. Oh, like, they're not putting Matt Beatty at first base. Are they going to put Pujols there? I mean, you know, it's the Dodgers. The irony. So, so Pujols will hit like three home runs against the Cardinals or something. Uh, well, I'm actually pulling. This is. I'm going to go against script a little bit and say that I would like the Cardinals to win that game just because I would much rather – run into the Cardinals down the road than the Dodgers. The Dodgers are, as we have probably said every week uh, during this show, basically an all-star team wearing the same jerseys. Um, and so, so you're, you're pulling the enemy of my enemy is my friend card. Uh, yeah. For one, for one day, Wednesday, oh, I will, okay. Wednesday, I will be pulling for the Cardinals. I, I, you know, some people say you, you should want to beat the best and that's all well and good, but I, I don't, Although I think a Dodgers uh, Giants and it would be the Dodgers and Giants playing in the uh, in the first or round division series if the Dodgers were to happen to win that wild card. Yeah, game. the winner of this playoff game goes to San Francisco. Yeah, so you know I think that would be fun in a lot of ways. Although I'm getting to a point where like where I got to stay up late to watch those games. I don't. It's gonna be it's gonna be tough on me. I'm not yeah. I'm not the night owl I once was, but. Uh, yeah, the well, Braves have the Brewers, and I'm I'm okay with that. You know, I think the Brewers are very good, but also they're not invincible. Uh, you know, one of their best relief pitchers decided that uh, that this would be a great time to uh, break his hand uh, on a How wall. How do you punch a wall in a celebration? I, I don't know. I, I that sounds. Yeah, we won. Sounds, I'm going to celebrate by punching a wall. It, it sounds a little suspect to me. I'm guessing there's a little more to the story than they want, but I can't say too much because Braves lost a starting pitcher early on this season to a broken hand. Uh, yeah, you know, was that um, um, Inoa, uh, Oscar Inoa, who kind of came out of nowhere to be one of their better starting pitchers early this season. Yeah, he was kind of rolling, had one bad start. Um, gosh, it might have been against the Brewers. Actually, I'd have to go back and I'd have to go back and look. But uh, yeah, then he he came into the dugout after that and broke his hand and was gone for a while. And that was one of those things between him and Acuna getting hurt that I was like kind of starting to write the season off. You know, they were they were getting close to the All Star break and hadn't really found that next gear. And the only saving grace was that the Mets and Phillies never found that gear either. So, uh. Yeah, that's a that's one of those where I think the Braves could win it, but I'm not I'm not gonna be particularly heartbroken if they don't. You know, it's this uh, this is a fun team, and I hope they keep it going. But uh, expectations have to be tempered. The American League, I don't know. I'm not I'm not real sure what to make of it. The Rays are so the the mostly to me, it's just the most uninteresting things happen as it turns out, as far as playoff berths, you know, Red Sox, Yankees, uh, you know, the Rays just kind of methodically winning a whole buttload of games, despite not having a lot of like household names or interesting way of playing. Like the old 72 dolphins, the no name defense, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not Rays, sure right now I could name six Tampa Bay Rays. I mean, they had uh, – who was it they had uh, They had pitching yesterday? Michael Walker pitching yesterday. Yeah, I saw that. And, and um, really pitching really well. And it's just – it gets to be kind of a boring story to hear, oh, this, uh, this journeyman pitcher goes to the Rays and they figure something out with him. And, I mean, you know, Charlie Morton's pitching for the Braves right now, and he kind of went down to Tampa Bay and, and mm -hmm. uh, re rediscovered himself. And so – yeah, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but uh, it works. It's just not interesting because they basically bring guys in, and then once they have to pay them a little bit, then they send them on their way and bring the next guys up and and, and trade them off for youngsters and and reload. Yeah, I mean it works. It's just it's boring to me. <laughs> um, I'm not I, I'm not really pulling for that. Um, I don't know though. I'm, I, I look at the American League and I think, what do I want to happen? Because None of these teams are, uh, to me, I guess, you know, the thing about the Yankees is, again, Chad Green's on the Yankees, and I I like to see him do well. Um, I'm a fan of the Astros, and, and you you know, there's all kinds of interesting, you know, potentially Pujols starting against the Cardinals, Brewers and Braves. That's, um, you know, Braves started in Milwaukee, um, yeah. the Yankees, Red Sox, but probably one that 
um, the media will finally touch on here is we may get to see two 90 year old managers walk out drooling, yelling at each other, and Dusty Baker and Tony Russo renewing their hatred for each other and the White Sox and Astros. Yeah, I, I, um, I like the White Sox. I, I'm not a big Tony La Russa fan. People who know me well could attest to that. But, uh, but um, you know, I think that they're a fun team and they've got a lot of good personalities in the dugout. So that would be that would be my preference. I think to come out of the American League uh, to see them to see them do it. Uh, I, I at least. I at least broached the subject with my wife this morning uh, before she left for work. Going to Milwaukee? You know, yeah, Milwaukee's not that far away. You know, like, you can make a day of that on Saturday, you know. Um, we'll see how that goes. I'm not really. Did she give you that look, Whitey? No, nah, you know, she's. she's like, are you nuts? No, nah, pre- she's pretty accommodating with that stuff. I've done, uh, we, I've done crazier spontaneous things than that and gotten mm-hmm. mostly, mostly good support. But, uh, you know, what, the last time I went to a Braves playoff game was in St. Louis, and uh, that left a bad taste in my mouth because that was the day that Marcelo Zuna hit two home runs. Uh, and I think as Molina got the walk off there. And I took my daughter, and we really wanted to see the Braves clinch a division series that day. And not only did they <laughs> not clinch it, but then they came out the, the next game, and, and Mike fulton happened. Uh, up, throw straight. What, is that when they scored like nine runs in the first inning? Was it, it was nine or ten? I don't know. I've tried to pretty well block it off. That was one of those deals where it was an afternoon game, and I was at work that day, and I was listening to it on the radio on my way home, and I just turned it off. And now, if I remember right, literally the Braves were like one pitch away from getting out of that inning early without anything happening, weren't they? Yeah, there was. And some- it was like eight two out hits in a row or something or walks there was some there was definitely some bad uh, bad luck in play there for Fulton Evich but also he's a guy who historically throughout his career couldn't couldn't shake off uh if a teammate made a mistake or if an umpire didn't give him a corner then he okay. he'd fall to pieces it's kind of uh uh, he's the kind Carlos of, Martinez of the Braves. Yeah, and Gio Gonzalez is another guy. He pitched for the Nationals for quite quite a while. Uh, uh, he had kind of the same thing. You could always tell how one of his starts was going to go by the way the first couple innings went. He just couldn't couldn't shake things off. And that's a man. That's a big thing about professional baseball. I mean, it's these guys. You're facing top quality competition. So like, it's, it's not always going to go your way and you got to be able to just move on and make the next play. And that's, I mean, that's easy for me to say, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I really just want something different. The giants are interesting to me because it's different. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, predicted, you know, they kind of came out right. of nowhere and won a bunch of games and, and that's fun to me. Uh, people want to raise questions about how they're doing it. Uh, show me some evidence before you make those kind of accusations. I say, I know that the current landscape of baseball is such that uh, I, I understand why people uh, ask questions and, and wonder what the team is doing behind the scenes to, to help it succeed. The Astros kind of made that a uh, national story, but I don't, they're, they're probably not alone. Uh, but, but show me, show me some evidence before you get too far along with that teams don't win a hundred and, what was it? how many did the Giants end up winning? 107, something like 106, that. 107, yeah. Uh, you don't you don't win that many games uh, by um, by not being uh, pretty, you know, playing well and being talented too. Uh, just just throwing this out there, the Cardinals did win the season series against the Giants. Did they? Did they, they actually swept them a three game series? Yeah. Um, you know, I'd be interested to see that. I think. While Dodgers Giants would obviously get, uh, you know, that's a, a long time rivalry. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't mean much to me personally. So I don't. It, it is, it is what it is. But uh, uh, yeah, I think I'd like to see the Cardinals get the Dodgers out of there. So uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, those conversations right. will flesh out a lot more by the time we talk next week. So we'll be able to hit on it a little bit. But uh, sounds good. Know. Again, you know, the Bears won yesterday, but I don't – I'm. my daughter had basketball tryouts and I didn't even get to watch very much of it. And, 
And I think that that's probably just as well for the Bears most of the season. Uh, sounds like Fields played better, was given an opportunity to play better because I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to hold that uh, that first start of his career against him too much. He was put in a position to fail pretty much. Um, but uh, I don't know. I also didn't really watch the the Brady versus Patriots game very much either. I saw a little bit of it, and it was pretty um, it not very like exciting in the second quarter. So yeah. Matt Jones actually looked like the best quarterback on the field in this, what little bit I saw in the second quarter. Yeah, I, I, those, those storylines like the made-for-TV stuff. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's uh, it is what it is. You know, I, I don't think that Tom Brady or Bill Belichick probably care about it half as much as people love talking about. Uh, right. They, they, they understand it's a business and, and how it all goes. And so, you know, I, I think Tom Brady has kind of shown last, like. He wants. He talks about one play till he's fifty. Well, you know, I think we're seeing some signs that that might not be feasible. Maybe not as much as uh, Ben Roethlisberger. He seems like he might be. He seems like he might be about done based on what I saw in his game. Uh, I don't know though. I got uh, very little to add into that, and we've been going for an hour anyway. And you got okay. to do, Mike, and I've got. I got work to do. It's, uh, I get to drive to beautiful Mount Vernon here in, in minutes. So I literally go from here to walk out and jump my vehicle. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll, uh, I think we'll call the week then. Uh, again, any, anybody who's, uh, who's seeing or hearing this, we appreciate it. Uh, feel free to, to share this, uh, you know, on different social media platforms and spread the word. We're still kind of going word of mouth. We're not at, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, we're just kind of hoping that uh, things take hold and get uh, kind of kind of a grassroots thing. So if you're if you like what you're hearing, uh, go back listen to some of our other shows. We've had some great interviews. This is the first time we haven't had a guest on, but we've had some great interviews so far. And we right. And next week's that. guest will be a heart from many many years ago. Okay. Who was in the news within the last couple of years? I mean, his name was bantied around that a couple of football games and uh yeah so we get to hear his story it should really be good um very good guy and uh person i call a friend so uh it'll be nice to uh get back to having an interview so people don't have to hear you and i so much <laughs> well with with that we'll give everyone that break they need so thanks uh thanks again for for watching and listening and we will see you next week take care see you buddy.